श्रीमद भगवद गीता चैप्टर एट वर्सेस थ्री एंड फोर द ब्लेस्ड लॉर्ड सेड द इम्यूटेबल इज द सुप्रीम ब्रह्म सेल्फहुड इज सेड टू बी इंटायरली प्रेजेंट इन द इंडिविजुअल प्लेन बाय एक्शन इज मेड द ऑफरिंग्स दैट ब्रिंग अबाउट द ओरिजिन ऑफ थिंग्स that which exists in the physical plane is the mutable entity and what exists in the divine plane is the person person with p referring to the supreme purush o best among the embodied beings i myself am the entity that exists in the sacrifice in this body i'll translate it a little more clearly for you we'll come to the verse the questioner says when arjun asks what is brahma adhyatma karma abhi adhi adhi bhut adhi dev adhi yagya shri krishna sa- response is presented in the verses above i want to understand the meaning of adhyatma karma adhibhut adhidev adhiyagya and why do they prefix adhi here all right so to complete these two we must also go to the two verses that precede these i'll read them out for you arjun said this is the opening verse of the chapter chapter 8 verse 1 arjun said krishna what is brahma what is adhyatma and what is karma what is adhibhut and what is adhi dev second verse krishna who is adhi yagya and how does he dwell in the body and how are you to be realized at the time of death by those of steadfast mind then comes the reply of krishna in the next two verses shri bhagwan said the supreme indestructible is brahma the supreme indestructible is brahma one's own self hmm? by self here is meant the individual self not the supreme self one's own self is called adhyatma and the primal resolve of god visarg which brings forth the existence of things is called karma hmm? we'll take these three first what is brahma brahma cannot be known by affirmation or positive instruction all that we know of has characteristics and we know a thing by its characteristics or properties that's the defining thing about a thing its characteristics remove the characteristics and it will be very difficult to talk of the thing at all right is there a thing without its characteristics no so that's the world we inhabit hmm a world of properties a world that can be named pointed at described as a story pictured 
projected. That's what this world is, right? Unfortunately for us, this world does not take our inner well-being too far. We exist in the world all right, but we never quite find absolute peace in the world. And the world means the one that has characteristics, the one that comes and goes, the one that is within the scope of time. Hmm? Is there world without things? And everything arises at a certain point and disappears at another point. That's the world, right? So there comes a point of time when the thing with all its names, properties, etc. suddenly comes into being. Not even suddenly. There is a cause-effect chain. So there always are causes behind everything. Even if the thing seems to appear at once abruptly. Right? And then there comes another point in time when the thing disappears. Brahm is for the ones who no more assign great value to these things because they are experienced enough, probably intelligent enough to have tested these things, penetrated these things and discovered that they can only do so much good and nothing beyond that. Things are useful in our day-to-day -day business. We require this mic, right? We require clothes. The body is there. The body is in itself a thing. How can we say things are all useless? Correct? We need food, we need water, all things. Right? Even thoughts are subtle things. Hmm? So things have their utility. Maybe things have great utility. Maybe things take you as far as the 99th milestone. But if the 100th is the destination, things somehow fail in reaching there. That's when Adhyatma kicks in. That's when you realize that you need to have something beyond things. For things, the world cannot be totally relied upon. And somehow the mind seeks perfect security. The mind doesn't come to rest unless until it is assured of total security. Therefore, we need Brahm. Therefore, we need something that is indestructible. What is Brahm? A reality? No, Brahm is not real. From where I look at Brahm, Brahm is our utmost need. Brahm is our utmost need. Now call Brahm unreal at your own peril. All our life, all we deal with and encounter is destructibles. And all destructibles betray us at some point or the other. Don't they? That's their name. That's their nature. To come, to go, to arrive and then perish. Now, at our own risk, can we deny something that never destructs? For if there is nothing that never destructs, then we are 
condemning ourselves to a hellish life, aren't we? Are you getting it? We live in constant restlessness because nothing lasts. Therefore, we require something that lasts. Brahm is that. Therefore, Brahm cannot be something within the universe because there is nothing in the universe that lasts. Therefore, Brahm has to be beyond. Therefore, the word transcendental. Now you could say, argue, that Brahm could as well then be a childish fantasy. We want something and that we are not finding available in this world. So maybe we are just fantasizing that thing. We are saying we want perfect security. We want something that is reliable, indestructible. Therefore, we are just conjuring the concept of Brahm. The argument has substance. But then the argument is defeated by the accomplishments of those who were able to achieve rest. That's the final proof. Are you getting it? If Brahm is a mere concept, a childish fantasy, then the peace associated with Brahm too would be merely an illusion, correct? But what if there are people who did attain to that peace? If even one person managed that, it proves that the stuff is doable. All right, but is there proof that even one person reached there? Well, the proof here lies in the comprehension of the one who seeks the proof. You have the words of Krishna. You have the life of Jesus. You have the songs of the thousands of fakirs and saints. You have the revelations that came to Muhammad. If you want to assert that all of this is self-delusion, then all right. But if you go through what those people have said and are left awestruck even by a single verse, then it means that the beyondness is indeed possible. And if beyondness is possible, then you better not dismiss Brahm. To dismiss Brahm is to dismiss the possibility of your own peace. Are you getting it? There is no other proof. When you are going through the scriptures, there comes a point when you just ask yourself, but this can't occur to a normal mind. How did this person dream this up? It is simply not possible that this kind of stuff can occur even to the sharpest kind of mortal intelligence. Then where did these lines come from? Did some aliens come and teach these things? But then, what kind of supremacy or speciality do you want to associate with aliens? At most, an, a higher IQ? What if you clearly see that the words in front of you are not a function of IQ at all? Instead, those words are coming from an extremely 
metaphysical insight. It is so incisive, it is so rare that one clearly hesitates in calling it a usual worldly phenomena. It is something else. It just can't occur to a normal man or woman. Are you getting it? That's the only proof. Otherwise everything is destructible. Otherwise everything is ephemeral. And if everything is ephemeral, then we are condemned to live as mental patients. People with mind-related disorders. Are you getting it? Hmm? Then, Adhyatma. Going into one's own mind is Adhyatma. Going into one's own mind is Adhyatma. Inquiring into the nature of one's self is Adhyatma. Remember I said one's self, not the self. And one's self means the personal self, the mind. You are not inquiring into the Atma or Brahm. No inquiry is possible into Atma or Brahm. Brahm or Atma are the end point of all inquiry. All inquiry stops at them. You don't inquire into them. Having inquired for long, when you come to the peaceful end of your inquiry, that is Brahma or Atma. Therefore, Adhyatma is not at all about inquiring into Atma. Adhyatma is an honest exploration into the facts of one's own daily life. How do I live? How do I think? How do I relate? How do I eat? How do I earn? That's Adhyatma. Getting it? Adhyatma therefore is no mumbo jumbo. Adhyatma is not about some esoteric practices. Hmm? Or cult based rituals. or verses in arcane languages. Adhyatma is the simple curiosity that makes you ask, hell, what did I just do? Is that too much? Hmm? You're roaming around let's say in a shopping mall and thoughts are roaming around in your head and you suddenly pause and say wait what's going on that's adhyat hmm? wait what's going on that's adhyat therefore adhyat has to be real time Therefore, it has to be like the light that shines on your regular daily usual activities. Therefore, it cannot be something special. It cannot be something divorced or separated, bifurcated from the rest of your life.
There is nothing greatly complicated about the phrase know thyself. Know thyself is adhyatma. And know thyself does not mean that you have to earn a doctorate in the complicated business of self-knowledge. Who are you? The one that you right now are. The one who is listening attentively, the one who is scratching his back, the one who feels intermittently interested in the neighbour rather than the lecturer. That's the one we are. Figuring this out and acknowledging this is Adhyatma. Hmm? What does Adhyatma have to do with Brahm? In the realm of Adhyatma, we keep hearing of Brahm so frequently, don't we? We just talked of Brahm, now we talked of Adhyatma. How are the two related? How are the two related? Brahm, we said, is the end point of all inquiry and Adhyatma is the inquiry itself. Do you see this? If you are really Adhyatmic, Brahm is what you will get. I am using the word loosely, you know, you don't really get Brahm. But just to make the point clear, Brahm is the end point of all inquiry. Poetically said, that's the end point at which even the inquirer vanishes. Because the inquiry is resolved. Now what will the inquirer do? When the disease is cured, does the patient exist at all? No. If the disease is gone, would you still be called a patient? So you're gone, right? That's Brahm. You're gone. The process that makes you go away is called Adhyatma. Is that clear? All right. Then Karma. By Karma is meant the offerings hmm, that bring about the existence of things. The world does not just exist. It exists to somebody. Therefore, when Arjun asks, what is karma? Sri Krishna will not give him a merely theoretical reply. What he is telling Arjun is, what is the right karma for you? What is the right karma for you? Or rather, what is the very definition of right karma? Except for that, all other action is bad action. When somebody asks you, what is action? And if you are a well-wisher to that person, you would want to tell him the highest possible definition of action, right? That's what Sri Krishna is doing here. Krishna is saying, that which you do in order to come to the right state of universe is karma. Sacrificing that which is not needed by you, sacrificing that which keeps you in illusion, that alone is karma. All else can be called as vikarma or distorted karma. Getting it? We all act, right? All our life, 
we have to compulsorily act. Sri Krishna is telling Arjun how to act. Act in the manner of sacrifice. That's the gold standard. Act in the manner of giving up, not in the manner of taking in, absorbing or accumulating. Every action of yours has to be an action that reduces you, that makes you give up some part of the inessential self that we carry. That alone is karma. Getting it? But that's not the kind of action we find ourselves or others engaging in usually. Then those actions do not deserve to be called as karma either. When Sri Krishna says karma, by default it means nishkam karma, right karma. Remember who is using the word? The word is colored by the one who is uttering it. Hmm? So act in a way that reduces you. Now tell me how are adhyatma and karma related? Adhyatma is the inquiry into your form, your shape, your structure, your composition. Right? And karm is the positive intent, the change that you bring about to give up all that is seen as useless in the process of self-inquiry. You looked into yourself and you found a lot of stuff that is needlessly present then right action is to get rid of those things. And it's not quite easy. It may take some effort, some doing, to tear those things away from your inner personality. Those things have been a part of you since long. It's not easy to drop them. They have to be torn apart. That is action. Just as action for Arjun in the battlefield is fighting his relatives, not easy at all. Getting it? Sri Krishna tells him very clearly, it's not about killing somebody outside of you. You have to fight your own inner weakness. As far as those people are concerned, who you see present in front of you, they are already dead. They are already gone. So it's not about killing Duryodhana or Dushasan. It's about fighting your own attachment that is making you subvert dharma itself. You very well know, Arjun, that the right thing to do at this moment is to put the right man on the throne of Hastinapur. You very well know who that right man is. You very well know whether Yudhishthir is a worse candidate compared to Duryodhan. You know which of these two should occupy the throne. And you also know the repercussions of the wrong man occupying the throne. We are talking of monarchy, not democracy. In monarchy, the personality of the monarch decides the fate of an entire population. You know Arjun who should be the monarch. But see, your inner entanglements are not allowing you to fight. Therefore, karm for you is to fight. Do you see what karm means? Something that makes you get rid of your inner weaknesses. Whenever you are acting, and you always are, keep asking this question. That which I am doing right now, is it liberating me of my weaknesses 
or is it consolidating, even decorating my weaknesses? Getting it? Then, it's a long question. In itself, it contains the gist of the entire session. Then the question moves over to the next verse and asks about the meaning of Adhibhut. Hmm. What is Adhibhut? Bhut refers to the primal elements. Bhut refers to the primal elements. In classical literature, when we say Bhut, it means the fundamental, primal elements. So what is Adhibhut then? All that you see around yourself, this is Adhibhut. All that you see around yourself is Adhibhut. Getting it? And all that which therefore relates to this world or arises from this world is called as Adhibhautik. Do you get this? This is Adhibhut and anything arises from this is Adhibhautik. Then, Adhidev. What is Adhidev? And Sri Krishna says, the shining Purush is Adhidev. Hmm? In the translation, it is mentioned that the shining Purush, the Adhidev, is Brahm. I beg to differ with the translation, no. Adhidev does not refer to Brahm. Adhidev refers to Ishwara. There is a great difference between these two. Hmm? For example, when troubles come to you, the scriptures will want to differentiate between Adhibhautik and Adhidevic troubles. That does not mean that the Adhidavic trouble has been sent upon you by Brahma. If Adhidav is Brahma, then Adhidavic stuff is operated by Brahma. But Brahma is a non-operator, non-doer. Brahma does not do anything. Adhidav is not Brahma. Adhidav is consciousness itself. Hmm? Consciousness itself. So by Adhibhut, you refer to all that which is unconscious. Right? And by Adhidev, you refer to consciousness itself. Right? The one that watches everything that is unconscious. Jad and Chetan. Jad is Adhibhut and Chetan is Adhidev. Then, what is Adhiyagya? Adhiyagya now refers to Brahma. Adhiyagya refers to Brahma. The one to whom you offer all your sacrifices. The one immeasurable ocean into which all currents of your offerings and your actions vanish. That is Adhiyagya. That is Brahm. Krishna does not mention Brahm here. Instead he says, I am Adhiyagya. But then who else is the Krishna of Bhagavad Gita except Brahm? When Krishna says, I am Adhiyagya, verily he means Brahma. 
Are you getting it? So, there is Adhibhut that you could think of as the Apara Prakriti of the previous chapter. There is Adhidev that you could take as Para Prakriti of chapter 7. And then there is Adhiyag that you could take as the Supreme Truth, Atma or Brahm of chapter 7. Right? The same model holds good here as well, though explained and referred to in a different way. Clear? Are all these terms clear?